three, two, one. And liftoff. Liftoff of Noah's Ghost Team, our newest weather sentinel in the sky to help keep us safe here on the ground. Gerald, let's listen in as we listen to United Launch Alliance Rob Kirsten, okay. who is the flight mission commentator. You have gone to close with control. The RD-180 is now throttling down as expected. Engine response looks good. We are now 33 seconds into flight. Atlas is 3 miles in altitude, 0.9 miles downrange distance. We have passed through Mach 1. The vehicle is now passing through Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. We throttle back those RD Now 55 seconds into the flight, Atlas is 7 miles in altitude, 4 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1900 miles per hour. RD-180 is now throttling back up. Backed off the throttle to reduce the stress of the rocket. To flight. Atlas is 13 miles in altitude, 10 miles downrange distance, traveling at 2,700 miles per hour. Coming now at 90 seconds, seconds into flight, ULA's Atlas V rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellants at a rate of more than 2,600 pounds per second. In 10 seconds, those solid rocket motors on the side will cut off beautiful shot from space. SRBs have burned out as expected, and we see a good SRB jettison. Clear shot of those Vehicle SRBs. Now executing closed loop steering. Here in a few seconds, they're going to throttle vehicle, back up. Vehicle performance looks good at this time. Now 135 seconds into flight. The RD-180 has throttled down slightly. Vehicle performance continues to look good at this time. Tank pressures are stable and Atlas booster battery voltages remain in their expected ranges. Now the upper stage is preparing for its use. Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing the flight levels. Now they'll jettison the payload fairing, which uh, protects GOES T at three minutes and 30 seconds. We have just over one minute until BECO. We're now seeing uh, the RD-180 throttle limiting to maintain a 2.5 G acceleration limit. Standing by for payload fairing jettison. And we've seen a successful payload fairing jettison. Good shot of those fairings. RD-180 is throttled back up now. And the vehicle has reached a 4.6 4 G acceleration limit and will maintain this level through BECO. And you're looking at animation now. We've seen that the Centaur has begun its boost phase chill down sequence. Booster about to cut off. And BECO, booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage separation and a successful stage separation event. We've seen pre start on the RL 10. And MESS 1, we have ignition for the first burn. This first burn of ULA's Centaur upper stage will place the GOES-T spacecraft into a parking orbit around the Earth. 
This burn will last just over seven minutes. What a shot there, huh, Mick? Yeah, that was great, Daryl, to see all that and listen to Rob Kesselman call that flight. Uh, the uh, first stage uh, performed very well this mo this afternoon, and everything's looking good. Those gyms. Control system as it begins its periodic firings to maintain thermal control conditioning. Yeah, those Gem 63s performed well, solid rocket boosters, and RD-180 performance well. What I really liked was when we saw the payload fairing come off. That was a great shot from the camera. Saw the payload fairing come off, and then most people probably noticed that little uh, half cylindrical come off after half payload way. fairings. Yeah. That was what we call the Centaur Ford Load Reaction Deck. Uh, because the fairing, the 5-meter fairing, encompasses both Centaur as expected. and the GOES t satellite, there's a a load ring that's inside the fairing around Centaur to help keep that 5-meter fairing from flexing. So that's what you saw when you came off there. I was wondering about that. The engine response remains nominal. I just and so word from the trajectory and performance group that booster performance was as expected for the booster phase of flight. All right, we're going to keep an eye on this burn and listen in. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll send it back uh, to Megan out the host desk. If you're just joining us, welcome live to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we just saw Ghost T launch from just behind us at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And guess what, everyone? I just found out that this was Kevin's first launch. It was. How was it? It was super exciting. Uh, almost a proud moment as an American, you know, 20-year uh, Air Force vet. And to be able to see this was was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. It was very fun to watch you react. Like you were like, I, I, I you were like a kid. Like, like oh, I have to kid. see this. Oh, wow. I it was, was great. Absolutely. It was great. So what's next for this mission? Well, the wonderful thing about this, now that we've had a successful launch, we have about 12 days before it actually reaches geostationary orbit. So at that point, um, that's when we'll start our checkout phase. We'll be looking for the data to come down from the from the spacecraft to make sure everything checks out, that the imagers, that the images are correct, all that kind of stuff has to work, work its way through. And you know, GOES is NOAA's latest weather satellite, as we've said. You know, we've been launching GOES satellites together for nearly 50 years. I mean, there's been so many advancements made in between those times. There have. And, you know, I like to remind people that, you know, this particular satellite in the series is really an evolutionary step, much like cell phones. Or when we talk about, hey, do you remember when we used to use landlines and rotary phones? Well, think about the leap we've taken from then to the cell phones and the capabilities that we have, much like that with our satellites. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. I feel safer knowing that GOES satellites are up there. And now I'd like to bring in NASA's Leah Martin, who got to watch the launch with our agency's deputy administrator, Leah. Hi, Megan. Like you said, I am here with Pam Milroy, NASA's deputy administrator. And what did you think of that launch? So exciting. It was exciting. And it, it was, I don't know, I always just feel this electricity. Uh, when a launch goes up, you're like, wow, people can do this. This is just the power and the majesty of it as you see it lifting into the heavens. It's always exciting. And, you know, hours and hours and months and months of work that go yes. into it. Absolutely. So, you know, NASA's vision is to expand uh, knowledge for the benefit of people here on Earth. That's the heart behind everything that we do. How does this mission fit into that? This mission is a great example of our mission. In, in a lot of different ways, I think one of the most uh, powerful things that we do at NASA is we partner with others to maximize the benefit of the things that we do. So this mission uh, to launch the GOES-T satellite will enable us to have cutting edge capabilities that are looking down on the Western Hemisphere, the Western part of the United States, to ensure that the data that goes into the NOAA models around weather, are uh, optimized, they're up to date, they will affect people's lives, whether it's farmers or protecting from wildfires. But what's interesting is we're also going to take that data because we have Earth scientists who are modeling our Earth as a system and climate far out into the future. This isn't an operational weather, which is what NOAA's mission is. They do it very well. But we take this data and we also use it for the benefit of science. So it's a really synergistic partnership. And you just mentioned uh, climate change and monitoring the changes because that is a priority for NASA. It is. It's one of our top priorities. We are already doing a significant amount in this area, Earth science and looking at our own Earth 
has always been a, an important part of our science mission. Interestingly, we also study other planets in the solar system, such as Mars, which we believe was once wet and had more of an atmosphere. And so the question is, how did it get the way that it did? And how do we make sure that does not happen to our planet? So it's a critical part of our, our mission. Well, we're hoping that the information that we get today can feed into the future missions of tomorrow. If nothing else, we'll certainly know the weather. Pam, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and we hope you enjoy you. the live. Exciting day. Megan, back to you. Thank you, Leah and Pam. And Kevin, GoSee doesn't just forecast the weather. We've talked about this a little bit. You know, we've talked about how it monitors the atmosphere uh, for fog, dust storms, and smoke, and, and uh, you know, uh, especially for wildfires. But what about, like, smoke and ash for volcanic eruptions? Yeah, absolutely. This past year has been kind of a revelation in our capabilities uh, to view volcanic eruptions. Uh, in particular, the, probably the most spectacular example will be the Tongan. What, but what we also have is another example in the Caribbean where you can see not only the amount of ash that goes up, but the, the area that it covers. And, and as a result of that, that, that particular hazard becomes an aviation hazard in particular. Yeah, you can see all the smoke there, you know. I, weirdly enough, two years ago, I was traveling in the Philippines, and there was a volcanic eruption there, and we had to ground hundreds of flights because of it. So so really, GOES helps decide whether or not it's safe to fly. They do. Again, NOAA's partner with the FAA, and they provide them with those volcanic ash, both forecasts and projections for where that ash could go. All right, we're now approaching another milestone in the ascent. Daryl and Mick, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. And we continue to burn, continue to get good numbers as we monitor the flight of the Centaur and yeah, GOES-T. Yeah, Centaur things are looking really great uh, on this flight. And uh, coming up on uh, MECO-1 of that Centaur engine as uh, Centaur continues to form, perform anomaly. We've heard pressures and everything look great. The system has gone open loop. Here in about 10 seconds, we'll have the Standing cutoff. Standing by for the end of the burn. And we have MECO, main engine has cut off. There you go. That completes that first burn. And so now we go into about an 11 minute coast phase. Mix. At this time, the GOES-T spacecraft and ULA Centaur upper stage are in an unpowered coast phase that will last approximately 11 minutes. The coast allows the vehicle to move to optimal orbital position in the orbit prior to beginning the second main engine burn. 